appearing on TED Talk is something very unexpected for me. But I'm honored to be included among the many luminaries that have graced this stage. But along with the honor, I realized that there was a major obligation. How could I have something to say that would be of interest to my listeners? And I wondered, would it have any impact, whatever I said? And that word, impact, I struck a chord because a few months ago, I was invited to give a talk at the Catholic, National Catholic University in Canberra to the senior leaders. And their, their main, their brand is impact through empathy. So today, and for a different setting, I thought I could delve again into that same theme. And by looking back on my long life, share with you through stories, some instances as I have experienced them of the benefits of impact through empathy. It seems to me that if we are to stand up and be counted, we need a great deal of love in our hearts. There's a whole world out there desperately in need of impact through empathy. Hubert Humphrey, Jr., who served as Vice President of the United States of America from 1963 to 1969, and he was a known spokesman for justice and compassion. He had this to say about the role of government in the role of suffering. The moral test of government is how it treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the aged, and those in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. In Australia in 1980s, came the very serious question of how best to respond to the HIV AIDS issue. This was a divisive community question which resulted in only some being willing to become involved. In Queensland, the Premier of the day stated in the daily paper that when these people became ill, nobody should help them in their illness because their illness was a direct punishment from God. He believed this, and at the time, he was a popular political figure. As well, there was widespread fear that the virus could be um, acquired simply by touching the clothes of somebody we met in the bus. You may remember how dramatic it was when Princess Diana shook the hands of a man known to have the virus. As Sisters of Mercy founder for the poor, the sick, education, and for the needy, particularly people with unmet needs. We waited, as did many others. We waited for the medical profession, the churches, anyone, to speak out against this stance of government, but nothing happened. The president of the Queensland AIDS Council approached our congregational leader at the time to ask if we may help. As the public face of the Martyr Hospital at the time, I was the obvious person to help or establish a link across the three groups, Queensland AIDS Council, the Sisters of Mercy, and the Martyr Hospitals, Brisbane. At the outset, I could foresee some serious problems. I knew nothing of the virus, nothing of how it was or was not transmitted, and I wondered how I could be of assistance to people whom I had never met and about whose lifestyle or needs, I knew nothing. As well, dressed as I am and as I was, I could see, it could seem to the men that I was just descending on them merely to impose values or to express judgments as a prerequisite for any help I might give. However, what I perceived as problems actually became moments of learning for us all. In a public statement we announced, the Sisters of Mercy wish to offer compassionate, non-judgmental support to those who need it. We will not impose services, but we request that we be allowed to walk alongside those who have HIV AIDS and to be available when needed. The Martyr provided the AIDS Council with a meeting place, office space, and three houses rent-free. So fearful was the average person of acquiring the disease 
that these men knew they mustn't, under any circumstances, reveal to anybody, particularly neighbours, what their medical condition was. However, one of our specialist uh, medical physicians um, said to me, bring them to my outpatient clinic and I'll see them. So there they sat comfortably among all the other patients. Nobody knew. I spent many evenings with groups of these men in their hideouts in Stanley Street, South Brisbane, listening to their needs to determine how I could help. As it turned out, wearing religious garb, far from being a deterrent, enabled me to go to places where other women might hesitate to go. It's strange now to look back on those times. Our involvement, though, was not without serious risk. We were acting against the wishes of the Premier, on whose government we depended for support for our three public hospitals. To complicate matters further, because the Queensland government would not provide financial aid to the local AIDS council, the sort of a rare secret agreement between the federal government and the martyr was created. For about two years, without the knowledge of the Premier and with the guarded approval of the martyr board, federal monies for the Queensland AIDS Council came directly to the martyr. Years later, I read that the then Federal Minister for Health, Dr. Neil Blewett, described the Sisters of Mercy as the most altruistic of money launderers. <laughs> but for us, these were worrying and dangerous times. Despite that, our task was not to judge, but to help where we could, and that's what we did. For me, there were many learning curves, as you can imagine. I was so ignorant of the whole situation. But one incident remains embedded in my mind. The president of the AIDS Council invited me to attend a mass that was to be celebrated in a unit in Dutton Park, Brisbane, um, at the bedside of a man who was dying of AIDS. On arrival at the bedside, I realized that the man was near death. There were only four persons in the room, because in those days, it was a practice of somebody, once he discovered that he had the virus, to advise his family that he had been fortunate enough to get a very good position in another state. So I knew that this man had no near relatives in Brisbane. Now, at the end of Mass, when it was obvious that the man had died, his partner threw himself across the bed in a paroxysm of grief. Now, I stood there, looking at them, and I realized that here were two men loved by God as much as all others, and I are loved. So I bent down, put my arms around him, raised him up, and held him. At that moment, the strange outcome of it all was that all my fear about not knowing how to help these men left me. I realized it was all a matter of love. For about seven years, we continued to work with these men, after which time they were able to deal directly with the community and with the Queensland government, because there had been a change of government. Now, a final story. Some years ago, my sister and I were on holidays in Ireland. Our family took us to see the Celtic Furrow, a centre that traces cultural, historical and spiritual roots in Ireland over 5,000 years all graphically depicted. We viewed beautiful gardens, fountains, stonework, bog oaks, and murals, informing us of the golden age of Christianity in Ireland, when art, culture, and learning flourished. There followed a walk through a meandering labyrinth, which depicted a thousand years of sad history in Ireland. Persecution, invasion, and famine all took toll on our ancestors but they remained a people of hope, as symbolized by the Celtic cross that stands resolutely in the center of the labyrinth. As we emerged from the labyrinth, we were confronted by a message writ large over the exit. 
the message read, 3000 AD, we are what we are today, mainly because of your decisions. So I ask you today, how do you make decisions about others? Are you judgmental? Or do you bring empathy into your relationships with others, regardless of the circumstances? The founders of the Sisters of Mercy, Catherine McCauley, answered this question. She described three levels of care. Sympathy, which can be an intellectual understanding that others are suffering, but it can be all brain and not much heart. Empathy, a genuine understanding of others, which engages the brain and the heart. But Catherine defined an even greater calling. Compassion, mercy, which she described as having an exquisite nose for the sufferings of others. This is a loving standard to which we should all aspire in every relationship we have. And I believe it's the key to having a real and positive impact on the lives of those around us and even on our loved country. May God bless each one of us. Thank you. Thank you very much.